Hey everyone, welcome to Midweek at the Compass. I'm joined by my friend Pete. What's up? Glad to be here. It's good to be here with you. So we are in this series on Just Ask. So during our When in Doubt sermon series, we wanted to know what questions you all had about the Christian faith, just to see if we could start trying to have some conversations around them. You guys asked really good questions. And we started last week with a really difficult one to have a very short conversation on of can Christians believe in evolution? And it led to this second question. Where do dinosaurs fit into the biblical narrative? We're going to talk about that now. So I don't know if you're anything like me, but my son is four years old. Maybe you think back to a time where you had a kid that young, or maybe you've babysat for somebody that young. My four-year-old loves one thing. And as much as I want to say it's me or my wife or the Chicago Cubs, um, it's none of those things. My son wow. loves dinosaurs. Wow. Huge fan of T-Rex, but he also knows a lot of like maybe, you know, some of the lesser known dinosaurs because he makes us read just about every book imaginable on it. Uh, T-Rex is by far the favorite, but talks about, you know, the Gigantosaurus and the Allosaurus and the Diplodocus and all of these things. There's something like a a Gigantosaurus is a real dinosaur? Gigantosaurus is a very real dinosaur. That sounds like something you could make up in a children's book. Oh, without question. But I mean, I can't pronounce half of these dinosaur names. (laughs) Uh, They're a little ridiculous, but we get to spend some time reading just all sorts of dinosaur stories together. You should have had him come for this conversation. I mean, he might be better suited than I am. Does he have the plastic toys, the little rubber dinosaurs? and More than we can count. Oh my gosh. See, you should have brought some dinosaurs. Uh, If I was thinking, I would have. So, funny story. I had a cinnamon roll this morning, and it's on a plate from a birthday party of his that is covered in dinosaurs. It's sitting in my car. Wow. No joke. Yeah. Now, You guys are really that, into dinosaurs. Well, one of us is. <laughs> Which means we read a lot of stories. And I find myself reading all these stories to him, and it talks about how, you know, 30 million, 50 million years ago, dinosaurs roamed the earth and were led to extinction by this giant ball of fire, a meteor falling from the sky. And there are times where I find myself reading it, and there are times where I find myself editing it, Mm. or I find myself trying to explain, well, some people think dot, 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 others think dot, dot, dot. And that just made me really curious of why am I doing that? (laughs) So before we get into the heavy hitting conversations, Pete, tell me what's your history with dinosaurs here? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm old, but I'm not that old. (laughs) I get teased a lot, but uh, I'm not that old. Uh, We never got into dinosaurs as a family. Um, My kids were into, when they were little, like Thomas the Tank Engine and Legos. Uh, They really got into comic books and uh, the Marvel Universe. Um, We got into a lot of that stuff, Star Wars. Yeah. But never got into dinosaurs. So you're telling me you're going to be no help today. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, you, I wondered why you even invited me to be part of this. I mean, is it really just because I'm old? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, and, but it is an interesting question, right? Because um, I think a lot of Christians have to kind of grapple with th- certain things like that. Why don't we see... Um, dinosaurs in the Bible. Why don't we get a little bit better picture of, if you will, the prehistoric world? Mm-hmm. Um, we, we love Jurassic Park and that kind of stuff. Uh, Barney, if you can even consider him a dinosaur, but um, we've made a big deal of dinosaurs in our culture. I mean, Barney is a dinosaur from our imagination, if I'm quoting the song lyrics correctly. It's been a while, but I think that's correct. Well, and there's some would say that, that all dinosaurs are something from our imagination. Ooh, right? I think that's a great segue. Yeah. So let's talk about it. Do we see dinosaurs in Scripture? Maybe we start there, and then we can try and figure out where else we can go with how can dinosaurs fit into a biblical narrative. And beyond that, yeah. maybe are we even missing the point? Yeah, it's a great question. It so, is a great question. Let's talk about it. Dinosaurs, mi- not even mythical creatures, large scale creatures in scripture. They might not be called dinosaurs, but we have at least some imagery. I would have loved it if we could translate something in the Hebrew to Gigantosaurus. Ooh, I mean, we could try. <laughs> that would be awesome. 
I, I mean, we're actually really close though, close though, right? With one reference in scripture of sure the behemoth. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the book of Job speaks of a couple of um, creatures, if you will, um, behemoth and Leviathan. And behemoth is this um, gigantosaurus <laughs> type creature um, who's got these just massive legs and body and is absolutely uncontrollable. And the same thing with Leviathan in the sea, right? It's this creature that cannot be tamed, cannot be seen, cannot be understood. It lives beneath the surface of the water and is the source of a great deal of fear. And so in Job, um, the, both of these are mentioned um, as a way to kind of humble Job. Hmm. You know, Job, can you take Bohemoth out for a walk? C can you catch Leviathan with your fishing rod? Um, I don't think so. You know, God keeps these as his pets in, you know, in, in, his, pa in his kingdom, right, in, in heaven. And uh, I can barely even walk a dog. Right. I mean, yeah. I have a hard time taming just about any creature, you know, but Leviathan and Behemoth. So the question is, are, are these uh, references to some type of, you know, prehistoric dinosaur type creatures? Or are these, you know, nothing more than a whale and uh, a, a, an elephant, right? Are, are yeah. these just uh, kind of exaggerated versions of animals that we have today? Interesting. So let's talk about animals a little bit more then, right? As Christians, a lot of times we have some very distinct views on creation sure. and the accounts. So we start to talk through, you know, we don't maybe definitively know about dinosaurs and where and if they fit into the biblical narrative. But we say things like they may have existed and died off after the flood. Or we get to the verses of Genesis 1-1 where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we've got God creating, and then there's the potential of a gap, right? There's some people interpret scripture after here as there's this gap theory where God created, and then there was this span of time before day one. Right. Or we can get into a little bit of, you know, maybe a day, yom, isn't a literal day, or maybe it is. And we start to try and fit science into what we're reading specifically in this Genesis account. Yeah, yeah. it's a great point. Because um, I, I think when we read Genesis 1 in particular, we're forced to ask ourselves um, whether or not this is, and the word that's always used is literal, hmm. right? Um, and that word literal is actually interesting because um, no one ever uses it literally. <laughs> um, rather ironic. Not anymore, at least, yeah. Definitely not. Well, even, even in this context, because what we're meaning by literal is that the Bible um, should be taken at face value, hmm. right? It says it plainly, and therefore we should interpret it plainly and not try to do a lot of linguistic acro acrobatics in order to make it say something different that doesn't fit with our traditional history of, of biblical interpretation, but instead fits with some type of view on science or sociology or history. Um, so this has been the accusation of a lot of very conservative um, Bible readers that by trying to make the Bible work with evolution, we're actually not taking the Bible literally. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a bit of a debate. You know, how should we read, in particular, Genesis 1 and 2? And when we read it literally, in that traditional sense, um, what does that mean for how we view dinosaurs? For instance, yeah. in fact, this question, how do dinosaurs fit into the biblical storyline in the Bible, is really only a question that emerges when we try to read the Bible literally, especially Genesis 1. Yeah. Because for those who would say, you know what, I don't have to see the Bible as a, a history book, as a science book about creation. I don't need to interpret these things uh, through a young earth lens. We can very easily say, well, dinosaurs were part of, you know, the created world prehistorically, a long time ago. And, uh, you know, they died out in a, an asteroid, you know, thing, a flood, um, disease, something, an ice age yeah. took them. Um, I can actually just say, I'll let science answer that question and I'll let the Bible answer the questions that it was meant to answer. So there's two things I want to get to. That last point, second. But the first one is you mm. use this term young earth. So just because we've got a few minutes here, yeah. talk to me a little bit about Young Earth versus what would be opposite, Old Earth? 
Yeah, I, I, it would be. Um, and, and that's definitely a term that's used in the debate. And so, um, so you mentioned the word yom, which is the Hebrew word for day. And so um, Genesis uses the word yom multiple times. We talk about on the first day, God created this. And on the second day, God created that. Um, and there was evening and there was you know morning and evening on the first day, on the second day. And at the end of every day, God says, this is good. Yeah. And um, it uses this word again and again and again. And um, young earth people would say that every time the word yom is used, it's meant to be a 24-hour period. And therefore, we have to see uh, this creation story as something that fits within six days. And then you have Adam who is created. And Adam is, lives, what was it, 930 years or so? Yep. Um, and he has kids. And when we line up the timeline, we come up with uh, an earth that is six, six, to, eight, six to 8,000 years old, um, really. And so certain people that say we need to take the Bible literally would line those things up and say we need to literally interpret Yom and these ages of these biblical characters and we need to take these at face value and when we do we come up with a very young earth now scientists today would say yeah, the earth is not 8,000 years old it's billions of years old and here's why we believe this when we look at uh, you know rate of carbon dating of certain things in our, our earth when we look at light and how it travels and how far things are apart and how we're able to see certain stars and not other things and how uh, energy is uh, transmitted around the universe like we would say no 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 the universe is billions of years old um, and so all of the things that we get that we see in this world in our world today are a matter of evolution they're a matter of uh, you know matter and energy and things evolving over millions and millions of years and so uh, literalists, biblical literalists would say, yeah, no, we can't back that into the Bible. The Bible says this, and therefore it has to be true. And we can't let these scientific theories, which is what many of them really still are, um, dictate what we believe to be true in the Bible. And, and I think they worry that, that compromising that area of biblical truth is to compromise all of it. If we can't trust the Bible from, the, from page one, how can we trust the rest of it is the question. Yeah. Yeah, and you can easily see how those would be very diametrically opposed positions. But you led us to a second question of maybe that doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's talk about that a little bit. And this really is a great question because it lets us bat around some really interesting things. It lets us interpret scripture. It lets us read commentaries and study science. I yeah. still, as a, you know, former chemistry major. I've mentioned that many times. It's always been a little bit of a what end of my brain am I thinking with right now? <laughs> right. Uh, but beyond that, it's really not about can we back science into scripture. Good science should support evidence of God and his creation. Mm -hmm. Now, with all of that said, what if it doesn't matter? Right. Tell me about this book. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the question is, what is what is the Bible? What is it meant to be? Uh, because I, I think, um, you know, when we talk about the Bible being um, inspired by God, uh, when we talk about it being inerrant, uh, without error in its original manuscripts, when we talk about it being infallible, that it doesn't fail, it accomplishes what it was meant to accomplish. When we load the Bible with those ideas, which I think are biblical and true, um, we can oftentimes let those ideas spill over into other areas, mm -hmm. like history. Does the Bible always record history accurately? Does the Bible record cosmology, or how the world and the universe was put together? Does it communicate cosmology accurately? Does it communicate things scientifically true? Um, can we rely on this book to be just as infallible about matters that are not spiritual, theological, or you know, religious in nature. Um, it, it's, it's a theological book meant primarily to be the revelation of God. And, and I think that, that we get into a lot of danger when we expect the Bible to be something that it's not. Hmm. So tell me where in Scripture we can see what the Bible is, right? We can say what it's not. We talked about that a little bit last week. There's law in here, but it's not a book of law. There's poetry in here, but it's not a book of poetry. There's history in here, but it's not a history book. On and on and on. Yeah. So if those aren't the things scripture is, we were talking earlier, what is yeah. scripture? 
Well, and I, and I think it's a great question. And I think a lot of different uh, pastors, theologians, uh, scholars would answer this in different ways. Um, you know, it is a book that comes out of history. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, many occasions, uh, historians and archaeologists have, uh, you know, discovered to their surprise that the Bible's pretty yeah. accurate about historical matters. Yeah. Um, we can rely on it as a really good uh, account of much of history. Uh, we also recognize that there are times when the Bible chooses to kind of diverge from what we know to be historical. In fact, diverge from what we know to be true about itself uh, because it's trying to prove a, a theological point, right? And so I think that's one of the keys to understanding the Bible is that the Bible is a theological book. Hmm. And it's meant, theology, right, to reveal the person of God. It's meant to give us a better understanding of who he is, and by doing so, a better understanding of the world that he's created. And when we get a glimpse of God, and when we understand the world that he created, his fingerprints on all the things around us, um, we begin to fine-tune our ears and our eyes and our hearts and our minds uh, to God's very presence. And so when we open up this book, we're not just reading a book that uh, you know was written 2,000 plus years ago. We're actually reading the living and active Word of God today. You know, the writer of Hebrews says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it divides. Yeah. It gives this book um, active kind of anthropomorphic language. This does something to me when I read it. I'm not doing the work of trying to find the truth. I'm not, you know, archaeologically digging into Scripture trying to find some kind of nugget. Well, that, that would be kind of fun sometimes. Well, I think that's how most people pr- uh, approach the Bible. Yeah. I've got to do the hard work of, of digging out this nugget of truth and then figuring out how to apply it to my life. And, and then I put this down and I go really, you know, try hard to make this work in my life. And I don't think that's actually what the Bible is about. I think when we read Scripture, uh, Scripture tells us that we meet the, the resurrected Christ in this book, through this book, that this is more like my cell phone, right, in, in, a, in a communicative way, because there's a, a God on the other end of this book that is actively talking to me, hmm. you know, revealing things to my heart, um, enlightening my mind, changing my moods and my attitudes. And when I allow God uh, to speak to me through this book as a conduit, not exalting this as the, as the highest uh, authority in my life, although it is a high authority, but God above all is. And tuning my heart and my mind and my life to hear from him is what this book is really all about. And I think we get really sideways when we don't let it be that. When we try to, when we, in a sense, isolate it down to a book of wisdom or a book of history or a book of science or, a, or some kind of defense, um, an apologetic of what we believe, we actually render the Bible to be far less than what it is. Yeah. We, we strip it of its power. And um, I think that's really unfortunate. So with all of that, how do dinosaurs bit fit in the <laughs> biblical narrative? I don't know. Right? I think that's where I would personally land on it. I, I don't definitively know. We yeah. can look and see cave drawings that you were talking about with me yeah. before we press record and how there are pictures of cavemen with dinosaurs. Not many, but they exist. And how old are they? Or is carbon dating accurate? Or all of these things. So where do they definitively fit? It's not stated. But you know what else isn't stated? Yeah. Giraffes. Your hamster. Guinea pigs. Your goldfish. Like <laughs> Your Honda CRV. <laughs> right. There are a lot of things that are historically tr- like in existence, but the Bible never mentions them. Yeah. So where do they fit in it, right? They're not the same question. And I think we both understand that. However, what's our worldview? Where are we pulling it from? What is it intended to be? When we're reading scripture, we're not doing it to understand all of history. We're doing it because it's living and it's active and it's God breathed and it changes us. And and I think when we read Genesis again. I think now that the, those of you who are watching this video, you're going to read Genesis through maybe a different lens. And when you do, you might even see some other things that cause some questions about, for instance, why do we have light before we have the sun? Um, you know, or you can ask questions like, did, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? <laughs> right? Those are great questions. And you read this <laughs> and you read commentaries to go along with it. Dig in, right? It's not just 
a fun question. Like, we had fun with this question. Right. Uh, it got us skewing and thinking of how are we going to actually address this in a way that honors the question and honors Scripture. And it, it's a, a bit of a dance, which is a fun conversation. Yeah. But that's not the totality of what we're called to do with Scripture. Well, and I hope that what this video has done is, is add some lenses to your Bible reading skills. Yep. To be able to see it as a theological work and, and listen theologically. And realize that what Genesis is trying to do is not create a, uh, a scientific cosmology, how we understand the universe. But instead, it's trying to reveal God and mm. the character of God, the nature of God, the purpose of God behind creation, how everything fits together and has an order to it. Yeah. Um, it, it really isn't trying to tell us how it works, but that it works. I love it. So we got to talk some theology today, which is really fun for me. I don't get to do it as much as you would think a pastor gets to all the time. But with that, there were some really good theological questions that you guys asked. What are they? Tune in next time. Let's talk a little bit more about it here, Midweek at the Compass.